Hello, everybody. I'm Isabel Griffin, Vice Chair of the Icon Scotland Group. Welcome to our Icon Scotland Take Five webinar, and thank you very much for joining. This is the third of these events that we've held. We had two last year, and we had hoped that by now we might have moved over to real life events. But seeing as that's not to be for the time being, we decided to have um, another couple of these webinars. So we've got this one today and then one coming up in June. Um, and as everybody's probably aware by now, the format is that we have five talks, each lasting five minutes with questions at the end. So if questions do occur to you when the speakers are talking, please put them into the Q&A, if possible flagging up which speaker they're for, and then we'll get round to them at the end. So we have five fantastic speakers lined up for today, and without further ado, I'm going to introduce our first speaker. So first up is Victoria Stevens. She's a freelance conservator, and she's going to talk about sensors working over time, tactile engagement for written heritage. So over to you, Victoria. Uh, thanks, Isabel, and thanks for inviting me along to share my presentation today. Um, as many of you will know, I'm a freelance a library and archive conservator and I'm going to talk to you today about my engagement journey um, which I'm currently um, in the process of making. So as a library and archive conservator my work is all about access and by improving the material or physical stability of an item more people can interact with it, understand it and enjoy it. As the need for do not touch notices in historical library collections can testify, visitors really want to engage physically with what they see. And museums really get this, but archives and special collections libraries seem to be a little bit behind the curve. Strange when the access to such collections is often freely accessible and all you need to do is get a reader's ticket. Uh, slide two, please. My sensory engagement epiphany began in 2012 with this incredible object, the examiner's copy of T. Lawrence's undergraduate thesis on Crusader castles. Um, it's a part academic study, part historical travelogue, and it's scrapbook format with inserts cut, drawn and collected by Lawrence during his long walk throughout what is modern day Syria. It's the physical embodiment of one young man's journey into almost myth. As an object, it's wonderfully tactile. The multi-layered inserts demand to be explored through touch, allowing a very personal and intimate connection with the man who compiled and formed the book from scratch himself. For example, you're able to feel the jagged and crude scissor cuts Lawrence made to create the text box stubs to accommodate all the inserts he used to illustrate his text. And so came the revelation, according to Take Five Engagement Chapter One, that if I get so much enjoyment and understanding from handling objects, Everyone can. Next slide, please. After this, chapters two and three of the revelation came very easily. If I had barriers to understanding visually through sight or reading, maybe I could interpret objects using some of the other senses such as touch, smell, taste, sound. And finally, if other senses other than sight are so important to fully understanding written heritage, how can I build them into inclusive engagement experiences that everybody can enjoy? Next slide, please. So, oh, sorry, back one. <laughs> sorry. If we could go back, back to the previous slide, that would be terrific. It's the one, uh, it's your, your five. Great, thank you. So Confucius summarized this perfectly. And um, here are some of my first journeys into sensory engagement. Look at the joy on the girl's face as she clutches the needle, having sewn her first section in a book ever. And hopefully she'll now look at books in a different way um, from this brief physical experience with how they were traditionally made. Take Five Engagement was very much born after experiences like this that you see in this slide here. Next slide, please. So the proposed multi-sensory workshops break down the concept of the book into its component parts, paper, media, structural materials, decoration, with each approached in a very tactile way. The practical sessions are supported with a wide variety of materials and equipment designed with heightened sensory engagement in mind. Uh, 
The aim is to take all these elements and journey with the participant, participants from raw ingredients to make their own completed book, showing how each component is made and how they interact to form the finished object, all with a multi-sensory approach. The full program ends with a grand finale, a properly staged exhibition of all the work and everybody's achievements. Each workshop is a learning and engagement journey in its own right and doesn't have to be slotted together to make into the whole program to make sense or be meaningful. As lockdown took hold once more and all the in-person sessions had to be put on hold, I started to think about how tactile workshops could be delivered online. And uh, I found this concept was not an oxymoron, not a contradiction in terms, but entirely possible. This tray that you can see on the um, slide here explores paper production using commonly found materials to explain fiber, pulping, sizing, and media interactions with the paper surface, all through senses other than sight. The participants could feel the paper surface and hear the changing properties uh, as the paper turns into pulp. Taste and smell the jelly that was going to be used as the surface size, see and smell the ink or the paint on the page, and all with easily available components gathered at short notice from within their own homes. For a first attempt, it worked really well. And with some careful preparation, all six elements of the program can be de de delivered online. Next slide, please. So where to now on this sensory journey? I'm looking for archive and museum partners to support me in my application to the Arts Council for startup funding to enable me to run a series of fully inclusive pilot workshops free of charge to both the museum and, and the participants involved. No one should be left behind because of cost. This will allow me to test the programme and give me scope to try out other areas for tactile engagement with archives, such as parchment and skin materials, seals and securing methods, and photographic processes. I've already received a very small grant to get some basic materials and I'm ready to roll out with scheduled projects at the Books History Festival and at Wordsworth Grasmere. And it would be great to think that someone in the audience, so there's somebody in the audience who would like to give me a platform to deliver a workshop for them too. Final slide, please. So I'd love everybody to get in touch who's interested. I'd, it would be great to hear from you and um, hopefully we can journey on this together. Thank you. Thanks very much, Victoria. That's a really exciting initiative. Um, and really hope you're successful with getting funding because it sounds like such a worthwhile thing to do. And um, I could see how it would work even done virtually. So thank you very much. Um, we're now going to have our next speaker, who's Holly Dawes, who's working at the National Museums of Scotland. And she's going to talk about the conservation of an Iranian tile panel at the National Museums of Scotland. So over to you, please, Holly. Thanks very much and hello everyone. Uh, my talk today is about the ongoing conservation work of this Safavid uh, period tile panel, which you can see on the slide. It's planned to be displayed as, the part, as part of the Arts of Iran exhibition at the National Museum of Scotland, uh, which is curated by Frederica Voigt, and the lead conservator on this project is Charles Stable. This conservation project has been made possible in part by a grant from the Art Fund. The tile panel was on long-term display in the National Museum Grand Gallery, and in 2007 it was removed and placed into storage. The panel itself dates from the 17th century and is associated with a garden palace in Isfahan, Iran. It's believed to have originated from a bathroom where it would have covered the lower part of the wall. The panel uh, consists of five sections and there are 114 tiles in total. The width of the panel is 450 centimetres and the combined weight and current mounting is a whopping 625 kilos. Uh, next slide, please. 
The tiles themselves are low fired or more accurately described as stone paste with overglazed enamel decoration. The tiles are heavily restored and the overpainting is now discolored and the restorations are starting to fail. The tile on the left hand side of the slide should give you a good idea of the overall condition of the panels. Uh, the aim of the treatment is to remove the tiles from their current backing to improve the stability and appearance of the tiles and to remount. The challenges of the treatment have been firstly handling the panel sections. They're very heavy and lifting equipment has been used. Uh, the overglazed enamel decoration is very vulnerable to damage as it sits on the surface of the tile. And the low fire body is also vulnerable because it's very soft and porous. These factors combined with the backing, which is made of materials that's been difficult to reverse, have really been the key considerations in planning the decision making. Next slide, please. So the first treatment step was dismantling. The backing consists of multiple layers, which you can see there on the left hand side. So you've got a plaster bed which supports the tiles, render with a metal lath embedded and then the final wooden frame. So we will remove the tiles by applying a facing of tissue and PVA glue, turning the panels and then removing the backing from the reverse. Uh, once the uh, tiles were dismantled, they were cleaned and it became apparent at this stage that there was possibly a coating on the surface or some of the surfaces. And that's what you can see in the top right hand image, a sort of haloing effect of the coating. So we've tried a range of sol uh, solvent testing and we feel it's likely to be degraded linseed oil. We haven't been able to totally remove it, but we have been able to reduce it. And finally, the break edges were mechanically cleaned to remove plaster dust and consolidated. And next slide, please. The next stage of the treatment was to create the fills and to bond. We decided to use removable fills um, and missing areas were cast using a soft plaster and a barrier layer was applied to stop any reintroduction of plaster dust. These sections were then bonded using an acrylic adhesive and any fill at gaps were filled. We trialled two different uh, approaches for retouching the fills. The, the panels are currently heavy, heavily overpainted and we really wanted to minimise this. So our options were recreating the pattern fully or using a tonal colour scheme. Recreating the pattern fully did allow us to integrate the fills. However, there are some areas where no original pattern could be copied and therefore it would have to be inferred. The tonal option did uh, allowed us to integrate the fill sympathetically whilst not interfering with the overall reading of the uh, tile pattern and crucially not hiding the restoration. Having trialled both methods and discussed uh, discussing the options with the curator, we've decided to move forward with the tonal uh, option. Uh, so next slide, please. To date, we have completed the treatment of 24 out of the 114 tiles, and we are currently treating the tiles from two further dismantled sections. So once the tile treatment phase is completed, the tiles will be mounted onto a light aluminium honeycomb board, which will greatly reduce the weight of the panels. Importantly, uh, remounting will remove the need for heavy lifting equipment, and it will make it possible to handle the panels uh, manually, which will greatly increase the flexibility for display. Currently, there are very few examples of tile panels from this period within museum collections, and therefore this conservation work is key to allow the panels to be redisplayed. Uh, thank you very much, and I will hand back for the next speaker. Brilliant. Thanks, Holly. That was really interesting. Lovely pictures, which is always good to cheer us all up. So thank you. That was great. Um, I'm now going to introduce our next speaker, who is Helene Van Santen. She's a freelance conservator and her presentation is entitled Learn by Doing, the Casting, Finishing and Patinating of Bronzes. So over to you, please, Helene. Hi, Isabel, everybody, and thank you, Isabel, for that introduction. Um, many thanks to Icon Scotland for organizing this webinar. And it's been really nice to hear what everybody has been up to. Um, today, I will be sharing with you a recent project that I was part of, an experimental approach to the casting, finishing, and patinating of bronzes. This project brought together a designer, a makerspace, and myself, the conservator. Uh, next slide, please. 
thank you. Um, here you see us in the workshop, hard at work making our casting molds. Uh, the basis of this research project was a joint interest from all three parties in expanding our practical knowledge on the casting and finishing of bronze with a particular interest in patinating as a way to color the bronze surface. Patination and patina are commonly used terms, but different groups will take these terms to mean different things. Mainly, patina will be used as a positive indication of an aged surface, and this nebulous term may or may not imply qualities like beauty, craftsmanship, and authenticity. For the purpose of this project, we understood patination to be the application of a chemical patination liquid to the metal surface, causing the metal to corrode, thereby forming a desirable color. This desirable corrosion layer is the patina. As a metals conservator, I encounter corrosion in almost all of the objects that I work on. Vital is that I discern between unintentionally corroded surfaces, which have altered or disfigured the intended look of an object, and intentionally applied finishing layers, such as patinas. This is not always an easy discernment and may require the visual and analytical analysis of the surface, supported by context given by the conservation history of the object and relevant art historical source analysis. Gaining practical experience with the manufacturing process of patinated surfaces therefore offers material knowledge, which is an additional quality to understanding a metal surface. Next slide, please. The strongest aspect of this project was its collaborative nature, with all three parties bringing our own expertise to the table. My input was my experience with metalworking, my knowledge of corrosion and chemistry, and the literature research I undertook into the chemical patination recipes and patination techniques that are available. La -di -da, designers and architects, Laura van Santen, my sister, uh, was the one who set up this project and brought the other particip participants together. Her strengths were her experience with the creative design process, technical knowledge of prototyping, innovative use of techniques and materials, and the emphasis she placed on the aesthetics of the project. And we were privileged to be able to collaborate with the makerspace, Make Eintova, where the foundry there offered the technical know-how, facilities and materials necessary to realize this project. Next slide, please. Uh, and here we see the results of our experimental work. Using three different casting techniques, we cast nine sets of sample pieces and each set consisting of nine concentric rings. Um, it may or may not have uh, been part of this project that some Lord of the Rings references were made. Um, per set, one chemical patination recipe was used, and this recipe was applied using different application techniques per ring. We based our selection of these nine recipes on the variety of colors in the patinas and chose low toxicity recipes, which we easily got to work for us. We are aware of the hurdles that might keep anyone from working with patination and being unsure what a pattern is, not having the confidence to work with chemicals, having difficulty choosing a patination solution or application technique. Having worked through these issues ourselves, we wanted to organize our results in a way that we could share the insights that we gained. Next slide, please. And here we see the results of our experiment. Oh, nope, sorry. Here we see the installation of our patinated sample pieces and casting molds as a permanent exhibition at Make Eintova, which we hope will inspire the makers working there to consider this technique for their work. To organize the samples, we used a grid system with each vertical line showing one patination recipe and each horizontal line showing one application technique. Next slide, please. And to reach further audiences outside of the makerspace, we produced a digital publication on the project. This publication details the casting methods, patination recipes, and application techniques that we used. Most importantly, it contains the results of the patination experiments on a macro and micro level. This publication will be made available as a free download from the Make Eindhoven website sometime in the next month. But until that page is up, please do reach out to me if you are interested in receiving a copy and I will happily share that PDF with you. And I have my email address up on the page. All three parties came into this project with different goals and expectations. And it definitely took all three of us to mold the project into what it has become. We hope that sharing our insights will make patination more accessible and therefore inspire people to do their own experimentation. I know that I will definitely continue working with this technique and will be applying my knowledge in my conservation work. Next slide, please. 
And I would like to thank the following people, particularly Lava Fonsantin and the Creative Industries Fund for making this project possible. Thank you for your attention. And back to you, Isabel. Great, thank you very much, Helene. Um, that was a really interesting talk and I think interesting, interesting aspects to, to explore about the kind of crossover between art and creativity and conservation and, and where the two meet. So thank you very much. Um, and I'm sure there'll be some good questions for you. Um, I'm now going to hand over to our next speaker, who is Leslie Stevenson from the National Galleries of Scotland. And she's going to talk about conservation live, public engagement from a digital distance. So over to you, Leslie. Thanks, Isabel. And uh, thanks to uh, Icon Scotland for organizing this event. Um, the next slide, please. I'm going to talk about a project that was rejigged in the face of the strange environment we've all been living and working in um, this last year. Completed in 1847, Christ Teacheth Humility represents the Edinburgh-born artist Robert Scott Lauder's greatest achievement, as well as his largest. Over two metres in height and three metres in width, it constitutes his ambitious entry for a competition organised to find pictures for the Houses of Parliament. It was acquired several years later in the hope that the monumental work, work would establish a Scottish National Gallery. More recently, the painting returned to Edinburgh in August 2019 after having been out on loan uh, since 1983. It had been earmarked for conservation treatment as preparation for display in a brand new suite of galleries specifically designed to celebrate Scottish art. These spaces are currently under construction at the Mound and will open later next year. The objective of the original so-called Conservation Live project was to highlight both the importance of this specific work to the establishment of the gallery, also the artist's contribution to, de to the development of art in Scotland. Pre-coronavirus, we had intended to restore the painting in a public gallery alongside the Titian Poesia exhibition. This would have promoted the work of the conservation department while demonstrating the impact on the artist of five years spent in Italy. With Titian cancelled and the painting too large to fit safely in the conservation department's painting studio, an alternative location for this project was required. An unlikely ally, the COVID pandemic, opened up the possibility of using an empty gallery in the Royal Scottish Academy. Coincidentally, the original gallery space for the painting, and this is where it is at present. Next slide, please. The conservation treatment is fairly straightforward and consists of varnish removal and restoration with some minor tear repairs. Although unlined, it remains relatively stable and was strip lined in, in the early 1980s. Uh, I hope that these, dem these details demonstrate that although subtle, the improvement in clarity of form and depth of field is marked following cleaning and evidence suggests that the painting had been treated selectively in the past with lighter areas cleaned more thoroughly, but the background left relatively untouched. With time, this had resulted in a tonal imbalance across the composition. And the next slide, please. A thorough investigation of materials and methods used by the artist was also fundamental to the project. Last year, we hosted a student placement from Glasgow University's technical art history course and were able to examine the painting with portable X-ray fluorescence. XRF identifies the heavier non-organic chemical elements contained within a paint film and we can extrapolate from this information the range of pigments used. Despite obvious limitations, it's a useful starting point and avoids the need for sampling. In a nutshell of note, we were able to confirm that Scott Lauder used a combination of traditional as well as more modern 19th century pigments. For example, two yellows were identified, Naples yellow um, used by Titian, a lead based yellow and chrome yellow, um, which was uh, only introduced to the artist's palette from the second decade of the 19th century. Next slide, please. 
A second method of examination using our own equipment is infrared reflectography, and this is the technique used to look below the paint layers, specifically at the preparatory stages of a composition, if carried out in a carbon containing material. We're fortunate in having access to both an oil study and a watercolour sketch related to the large painting in our own collection for comparison. Uh, next slide, please. Infrared revealed some interesting characteristics and in short, Scott Lauder did not adopt a consistent approach and many minor adjustments were made during the painting process. Next slide, please. Turning finally to the digital offer, the promise of which was crucial in overturning the project's earlier cancellation. In summary, there has been a regular Instagram and Twitter feed of images and snippets of information on the project's progress on the NGS website, featuring, including the first live Q&A session. The blog format has proved to be an effective conduit for information and there are three already available on the painting, with three still to come exploring aspects of the frame. As part of the wider SNG project, a short film documenting all stages of the project is also well underway. Finally, the story was picked up by the national press, BBC Radio Scotland, Radio 4, and more recently BBC Reporting Scotland. The experience has underlined an apparently insatiable public appetite for conservation chat or peak behind the scenes, no doubt enhanced by COVID fatigue elsewhere in the news. Conservators are increasingly encouraged to promote their work on online platforms, um, as I'm sure this audience is well aware. And if managed appropriate, appropriately, this can only be a good thing in raising the profile of our profession. However, as a final note, I would stress that these skills do not necessarily come naturally and speaking personally, the experience can contribute significantly to the ageing process of the conservator, if not the artwork. And the final slide, please. Um, the project has been a huge joint effort across many NGS departments and beyond, so a huge thank you to the very many people involved. Thanks. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Leslie. And I have to say, from what I have seen of your media appearances, I think you're downplaying your skills in that area. And I particularly like the fact that the painting was that you've been treating the painting in the space where it was where it was originally displayed. I think that's a really nice kind of circle of the story. I'm now going to introduce our final speaker. She's Beth Gillians. She's a textile conservation student at the University of Glasgow, and she's going to talk about conditional confusion, considering variations in language used for object documentation. So over to you, please, Beth. Lovely, thank you, Isabel, and hello, everyone. Welcome to this short talk on my research into variations in use of terminology within object condition documentation. So my name is Beth Gillians, and I'm currently in my final year studying textile conservation at the Textile Conservation Centre based at the University of Glasgow. This presentation is an introduction to the ideas around which I am basing my dissertation research for the MPhil course. So it is an ongoing project, very much still in development. So without a further ado, we shall dive right in. Next slide, please. So this project idea first germinated whilst I was completing my virtual placement project last summer in conjunction with the Museum of London. Um, though in a way it's perhaps the least glamorous side of conservation, I'm sure in recent times we've all come to appreciate ever more deeply the value of, of good documentation in light of the COVID-19 pandemic and its limitations on our physical access to objects and collections. So condition documentation is of course the root of so much conservation decision making. So the content, context and comprehension of it is fundamental to all treatment. Yet it became clear to me at this time that the realities of documenting the condition of a historic collection are far removed from the somewhat standard approach we develop at the CTC. As we all know, a huge range of factors can influence the who, why and the how of condition reporting. And this caused me to question how consistent or reliable the words we use to ascribe condition really are. So firstly, I should define what I mean by condition documentation in the context of this project. 
and that is any written record regarding an historic object or collection which alludes to physical state. This, of course, encompasses a range of types of documentation, and I shall be broadly categorizing these based on methodology, comparing terminology used in a more standardized tick box style form with that used in a more long form discursive report to consider whether the ways in which we record condition influences the variety and frequency of vocabulary we use. Moreover, while one of the wonderful things about the conservation field is the variety of backgrounds and types of training individuals have had, that said, it must also be noted that conservators, as we know, are not the only heritage professionals who record object condition. It may seem quite obvious to point out that this could contribute to variations in the use and understanding of terms, but it is fundamental importance that we are conscious of our own potential bias within all aspects of decision making if our treatments are to hold up to both the technical and ethical tests of time. So the research I shall be carrying out will hinge on two aspects, which first of all is generation of a comparative literature review, which will consider influential factors which impact on variations in condition terminology. And the second half will be an interactive survey which will present participants with high quality images of objects to gain their professional judgments and compare the range and frequency of term use. So it's hoped that this will indicate the extent of variation in terminology used and provide evidence which indicates why such variations exist. Sorry, Krista. <laughs> in this vein, I would like to try a little experiment um, using the polling function of Zoom, so you might have to bear with me. Um, so let me get this launched. Okay, so this will not be used in my research, I should say ahead of time. It's entirely anonymous. Um, you're fully entitled to not participate if you don't want to. Um, but a couple of months of poll choice questions should have come up on your screen. Um, and if you feel comfortable to do so, please do select the appropriate options. Um, it should be interesting to see. We generally have a good range of people attending Icon Scotland events. So it'd be nice to see what you think about the methods you use and the words you use to record condition. So I'll give you a few more seconds to answer and we'll hopefully let you know the results when they come in. So I'll finish up maybe whilst that's carrying on. Um, I hope you can see the potential of this field of research. There is so much work to be done. Um, and I see this as personally as a first step in deepening my own reflective practice, but also within the wider field. So many, many questions can be raised, which I won't be able to fully address due to the practical scope of the project. But I hope in time this work can be further developed and additional research carried out to address such questions as if vocabulary does vary, is standardization the answer? Or is that a limitation in and of itself? Um, could standardization ever hope to be achieved in such a wide ranging field as conservation? And if interpretation of condition terminology is variable, what impact does this have on our approaches to object treatment? So I think I can share the results now. Um, and I'd like to conclude, I'd like to thank you all for your time and engagement. Um, if we could go to the last slide, maybe. Um, yeah, so I'd like to thank you all for your time and engagement. And if you'd be interested in hearing more about the project and participating in the survey, or know of anyone who may be conservator or otherwise, um, please don't hesitate to get in touch. My email is on screen now. And my thanks should also go to my supervisor, Sarah Foskett, all at the TCC and the committee for having me today. And I look forward to any questions you might have. Thank you. Brilliant. Thanks, Beth. That research sounds really worthwhile. And I'm so impressed that you managed to get the poll to work. That's the first time we've had that in one of our um, presentations. So it's a great way to do it, I think. I'm now going to ask Krista to close the presentation and all our speakers to switch on their cameras. 
because we're now going to move into the Q&A. Um, if the audience could work out how to do it, I'd recommend you speak to speak, you switch to speaker view so that you could see all the speakers at once. Um, and basically I'm going to read the questions out from the Q&A and direct them to the speakers and feel free if other questions occur to you audience to keep robbing them in and I'll do my best. So I'm going to start off with a couple for Holly. Um, first of all, Holly, um, someone's asking about where do the tiles come from? Which building and which city? Do you know? Uh, I, I do. It, they're associated with um, a palace in Isfahan, which is in Iran. Um, and uh, it's the palace doesn't exist anymore. Um, but as I believe, as sort of uh, each new ruler came in, they would build new palaces and and sort of reuse the building materials. So uh, they are from 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 what would be a very nice bathroom in a palace in Isfahan. Okay, great, thank you. And another one for you, Holly. Um, did the lockdown impact the project's progress and original outcomes for you? Did anything have to change because of lockdown? Um, yes, uh, we were, um, obviously we, we weren't able to come into the um, museum, so our programme was on hold, the practical side of things were on hold, um, but uh, we used the time to do other things uh, such as researching, looking at other projects, um, seeing what other um, sort of uh, how how sort of methods of mounting etc have been done in other projects so that's really sort of what we did towards this project in the lockdown and we are carrying on now and um uh and hopefully getting it getting it completed brilliant thank you very much okay um now i've got a question for victoria um so victoria what groups did you work with virtually and what adaptations did you have to make to the in-person delivery mode? Yeah, I, uh, the, the online, it's only had one outing, if I'm being honest. Um, and that was to uh, a sort of a pilot group of muse museum professionals. Um, but I'm working, I'm sort of working in person with a, um, the Avenue, which is a large um, co-educational special needs school in Reading. And um, I'm hoping to run the the um, remote program with them too, um, given that they've had so many restrictions on, on who they can allow on site. Mm. Uh, I think that the main adaptation is that you have to make it, if, if you're going to ask people to do sort of tactile access to things um, from their own, off their own bat, you've got to make the raw ingredients really, really simple. So on that tray, you had greaseproof paper compared with toilet roll or kitchen roll, um, which is, a, is an obvious thing. So you've got to make it to where there's easily accessible um, materials available. So instead of doing um, marbling with proper marbling materials and marbling inks, you would use an incredibly tactile substance, some shaving foam. So it's all about setting it up, having a very, very clear and very limited list of, of ingredients and then um, making sure that it can be done with household materials. Or else it just would never, mm. people just wouldn't do it. And can I ask you, Victoria, have you had to, have you kind of customised your workshops depending on the audience? So, you know, do you have a different version for, for children and adults and so on? Um, slightly I, I'm really this is one of the things I'm wanting to sort of test out because I'm really wanting them not to be sort of like an enclave I'm wanting them to be um, accessible and interesting to to anybody really anybody who wants to give it a go um, so it has to have um, a really broad base and a really broad point of contact with the audience um, it can't be it can't be I, the last thing I want is it to be just for X people just for Y people. Um, I am looking to, and it isn't just people who are neurodivergent, it's it's also people who have limitations in terms of physical ability to get to places. So that includes, you know, I'm I'm hoping to the Words, Words of Grasmere has a very good program with um, people who are currently in prison but also people who are either in a hospital setting or in um, a restricted 
um, mobility setting like an um, elderly care. So it has it has sort of wide applicability to to a great deal of, of um, target audiences, really, as well as being, you know, for for um, the, the regular sort of our engagement stuff that I do for for clients at, at sort of open days and, and mm. um, open house London and all that sort of thing. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to go to a question for Helene next. Um, so the question, Helene, is what did you learn from your collaborators that as a conservator might not have occurred to you? Um, yeah, that's a really nice question. Um, I think particularly the uh, approach to incorporating unconventional means or materials that uh, didn't have to be supported by, by re research was a, was a very nice way to go about experimenting. Um, putting myself in the mind of a, of a maker instead of a conservator made me understand the manufacturing process in a much more common sense way, if that, if that makes sense to you guys. Um, so it's, um, I think as a conservator, I would have felt a lot more pressure to, to support my choices. Um, whereas experimenting in this way was a much more, yeah, more, more free way of going about it. Um, also, I was very happy to learn from my collaborators in the way that they approached publication and um, presentation aspects, where there was a much more proactive approach to, um, to sh actively sharing results uh, and engaging with different audiences, which was very nice to learn from. Thanks. Brilliant. Thank you, Helene. And there's actually, there's a follow on one that kind of ties into what you've just been talking about. Um, could you say something about how you might apply the knowledge and experience you gain from the project in conservation practice? Mm -hmm. um, yes, uh, I, I think that the, the experience of, of using um, patination means that I now very much understand the, the limitations of, of the materials and therefore, uh, and the possibilities of the material, meaning that um, I think it will be much easier for me to uh, identify whether something has been patinated or mm -hmm. whether I'm seeing something that has um, deteriorated in a way that was not the intended um, surface. And I hope that in that it will be very useful. Um, having said that, patination is, is a bit of a pickle um, on account of the fact that corrosion happens whether intended or not intended, uh, or it can be somewhere in between the two. So it, it remains uh, a difficult a difficult topic, but I hope that uh, having worked with this, I will be able to recognize it better when I see it. Brilliant, thank you. Um, I'm going to go to Leslie next. Um, Leslie, did you feel you could engage the public better with your work than if people had been ob observing you actually physically in the gallery? So pros and cons of virtual versus real um, life yeah yes it definitely uh, obviously made it a bit more of a comfortable um treatment to undertake it, it um i think it's it could be quite difficult cleaning a painting in front of the public and um, it's a big big space and we'd gone through all the health and safety checks and it had been approved and we we're all ready to go um but um certainly we have reached a huge audience and I think no one anticipated the press interest and that was all to do with the pandemic and coming in and out of lockdown and um, the press wanted to project a story of a solo conservator working um, during lockdown, which of course I wasn't doing, no matter how many times you told them that um, that wasn't actually happening, that was the slant. But there were various museum stories in the press um, over the last few months um, reiterating that. It was it's great for our profession to, to get that much coverage, um, but probably did reach a lot more, um, a lot greater audience. Yep. Brilliant. Thanks, Leslie. And I'll ask you another one while I've got you. Um, what technical help did you need with the various outcomes? Um, that's a good question. We, well, 
with the Instagram and Twitter, we do have a big digital team at the galleries here. Um, interestingly, um, Radio 4 World at One required me to record something on my iPhone and then WhatsApp it to London. Um, so that that was certainly something I'd never done before. Um, and with the air conditioning in the gallery, it was quite noisy. Um, so I was hoping I got special permission to go in because I wanted to be in front of the painting to talk about it. Um, but it was too noisy in there. So I had to go and sort of crouch in a corner of another empty gallery and re record this and then um, send it by WhatsApp. Now, who would have thought that um, uh, BBC Radio 4 would have been going through such sort of basic means. Similarly, the radio interviews was all done, all done on a telephone line um, or at home. Um, uh, so, um, but yes, we are very well supported at the gallery. So I, I've been fortunate in that respect. Um, yeah. Okay, brilliant, thank you. I'm gonna ask Beth a couple. Um, Beth, one of the questions that's come up for you when I was going to ask the same thing myself is, is whether you're looking at, um, at a particular material or object group or you can write across the board at all, as all conservation practice. Um, yes to both, essentially. Um, so I obviously am a textile specialist and the objects I'll be using to um, be my survey um, will be textile objects. But my aim is that I'm going to try and get people from across the board as much as I can. Um, the literature review will definitely focus across the board and it will be, I think, a really good opportunity to compare and see if we all do talk about things in the same way. Um, because it's all very well and good, you know, but if, if we all trained in the same place as textile conservators, which I'm not saying we have, but a lot of us have, then obviously there's going to be some standardization within that. But it will be interesting to look at, I think, between you know, when I say stable, do I, if I'm looking at an object, do I mean the same thing as a metals conservator, you know, and, and do I mean the same thing as a, a curator who also condition reports and, and if I've had a different level of training to another person, does that make a difference? So I think those are all the, the things that really fascinate me about it is that what do we bring to condition reporting? Um, and are we really aware of the full extent of that? Because if, if we're not, then potentially that's a problem. Um, but it would, it would be really interesting to have that real comparison across the board and, and see, because um, I think that's just something that's not quite quite there yet, that we're not having that conversation yet. So, be good. Yeah, that, that all makes a lot of sense. Thank you. Um, there's also a question which you may which you may have to kind of, I don't know, it's because your work, your research isn't finished yet by any means, but so far, or gut feeling, um, are short-term formats or long-term formats more usable or better at capturing the most important information? Obviously both have pros and cons. Do you have feelings about, about which work better? I think, I mean, I, I do and I don't. I think the reality is that the context decides that so much and that you're not, you know, if you're doing a full major interventive treatment, you're probably not coming with a simplified short tick box form. But if you're having to shift through lots of objects as you're accessioning them, then possibly that's what you're looking at. So in that sense, the context of those things is so vital to what they are that that kind of complicates things further. That you know, I think I think it's the ways we use those we need to be aware of and we need to really think about and the language we use within them. So I'm, I think I probably won't advocate for one is better than the other, because obviously as a perfectionist, I'd like all the information we possibly could have. Um, but the reality is that that's not always necessary or appropriate. So it will be good to just, I think, see if we are using the tools that we already have to the best of our abilities, I think, um, or see if there's ways that we can advance those a bit more. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, I'm going to go back to Holly. There's a lot of people probing for technical information, Holly. Um, so you've probably seen some starting off somebody saying the larger losses in the ceramic tile panels were, were, were recreated using which materials so look for a bit more information about larger losses and then and proportions of those materials and then how what materials you use for the retouching 
Okay, so the larger losses were um, was a soft plaster. So any kind of big losses, um, sort of whole missing areas on on the tile, uh, we used uh, we were using removable fills. Um, so they were cast uh, in place, but uh, there was a barrier layer, and then taken apart and, and dried and refined uh, separately and then uh, bonded back into place but with a barrier layer all over the all over the um, removable fill just so that no plaster dust after cleaning all of the tiles for so long we didn't want any more plaster dust uh, to get onto any of the the break edges so those larger bits are our plaster fills and then any gaps were filled with uh, paraloidic glass bubbles Hey, thank you. Um, retouching as, uh, was um, golden acrylic uh, paints and um, using a golden gloss as well. Okay, thank you. And how are you proposing to fix the tile panels to the substrate, which I think you said was going to be an aluminium? Yeah, so um, at the moment, our, we, we haven't started that section, but our, so it's a sort of work in, in progress for us at the moment, but we are thinking of um, you, again having a barrier layer on on sort of the point of contact of the tiles and using uh, Araldite uh, 2015. Um, I think it's uh, there's a, it's been updated and it's now 2015-1, um, but that is what we're thinking currently. Um, we are we've just got some in, so we're going to start testing to see um, how that's going to work because we do have to think about um, some issues like leveling and the sizes of the tiles aren't totally uniform, so we will need to think about how. Um, what sort of gaps we're going to have between the tiles, how big they will need to be to sort of um, uh, to, to sort of counteract any differences in sizes. So um, it's we've got a few uh, a few issues to work out there, but um, that's that's our thinking at the moment to use an araldite um, with a barrier layer. OK, great. Thank you. Um, I'm going to come back to Victoria, if that's okay, Victoria, with a question that I noted down while, while you were talking. Um, so so the, the workshops you were describing are largely about kind of learning the techniques of how things are made. And I'm wondering to what extent you talk about conservation as part of those workshops, um, whether there's a way of kind of getting some kind of conservation messages across. Oh, very much. I mean, it, it, you know, it's all about material stability and, and material change. So, you know, I think conservation is sort of naturally slots into that really, doesn't it? You can't, you, you just can't help yourself. <laughs> um, and I think that it'll, it'll definitely um, uh, include um, materials that are, um, the ink one in particular has a lot about corrosion and environment and um, all of that, um, all of that side of, of the, the, more the deterioration and how that is dealt with um so that's that's quite interesting i mean i think that the ink and the pigment sort of session one of the six sessions is great because it sort of ticks lots of boxes with children um in particular um the, the, this sort of um dark magic side of things of ink making um and the the sort of rather gruesome ingredients that that um can go into into these things and into pigments and the poisonous nature of them i think it, it, it's a bit of a win for everybody isn't it everybody loves that sort of thing um so i think there's a lot of there's a lot of ways you can talk about um material properties i mean it's it's um and and from that naturally comes a conservation approach because it's just you can't you can't help yourself really you can't help but bring that in um it's not they're not conservation courses per se though um the the, the ones i've done for um other outreach sort of um activities um such as um the ink workshops that i've done um with with um one of the livery companies that's had a more of a conservation approach for older children um paper repair things like that mm -hmm. um and that's great fun um, the jelly, they, 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 uh, a bit like the the uh, girl who was sewing there. You know, they, they, they first of all go, oh, you know, you must have so much patience. What, why do you do, why do you do this? 
you know, a good question. Um, and I think that, you know, it's a, a, a really, um, people can't quite believe that somebody does this as a job. And I think that's a really good way in. Um, and to use it as an advocacy tool would be just wonderful if it encouraged people to, to explore, um, you know, conservation as a profession it would be terrific. Yes, brilliant, thank you, okay. Um, I think I've covered most of the questions that have come up um, because there's been a bit of repetition, but I might just come back to Leslie while we're talking about kind of interaction with the public and what the public are interested in and ask Leslie whether from, you know, from what we've got from the public in terms of the questions they've been asking or what the bits they've seemed to have particularly liked, um, what kind of things have been, have been have come up as themes of what people are interested in? Um, I suppose there's been um, quite limited, it's, it's been a bit one way, we've been putting out all this information, but I haven't received too, too much feedback. Um, but everyone's always has the same questions, how long is it going to take and what are you using and, um, and trying to understand the, the, the cleaning um, aspects and varnish removal. Um, I think there's more and more on on the television these days looking at the work of the conservator and um, that seems to have really stimulated um, a lot of interest but um, oh you must be terribly patient everyone will be sort of <laughs> familiar with that I am the least patient person in the world and um, so I, I, yeah um, so yes I suppose um, just the usual questions but that uh, I suppose it's, it's all about getting the information out there and um, the live question and answer um, session we hadn't done that before so I think the digital team um, had had all the questions ready because they knew that it, it was a, it was a bit of a, a guinea pig project and we wouldn't know but um, I think um, there's certainly a lot to build on um, but I, I think I'm um, Obviously, I think everyone these days is aware that social media is the way to, to reach um, new audiences and we're all being required to, to look into that. So I think you do learn um, with each project and you hope to get, get better at it. <laughs> Thanks, Isabel. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, and on that note of learning new things, I think we'll we'll draw to a close there but I could do a little plug for our next take five um, which is going to be on the 16th of June because I certainly I have to say I have certainly learned lots of things today about stuff I knew nothing about um, Iranian tiles and bronze patination and the like so um, I hope we'll have a good audience again for that um, I'd like to say a big thank you to all our speakers you've all been wonderful and coped with zoom very well and it's all gone as smoothly as we could have hoped for um, I'd also like to say a big thanks to um, our new events coordinator, Lina Rodriga May Moran. She's organised this event and done lots of work to get everybody lined up. Um, so thank you, Lina, for making it go so smoothly. And also to Krista Gerdvilke, who did the IT support. Um, and the fact that there haven't been any major disasters indicate that Krista has done her job well. Um, and also our social media officers, Gemma Matheson and Marta Polaska, who always do a great job of publicising our events. And also thank you to all our attendees, um, our audience, who did a great job of um, asking good questions and feeding in nice comments. So thank you for joining. Um, and I think that's all we need to say right now, but I shall look forward to seeing everybody, hopefully, in a month's time. Thank you again to our speakers. Bye, everybody, for now. Bye.